Hi, and welcome back to this tutorial series where we go over the various options available to 5th edition campaigns within Fantasy Grounds Unity. In this video, we will cover the options that affect the client, but are also the only set of options that a player can also adjust. Accessing the options panel is simply done by clicking this options button here in the top right part of your main menu or through the actual campaign setup option or panel, I should say, as it's right here in the last page. Both of these open up this interface. And before we move on to the rest of the options associated with this particular panel, I just want to point out this little question mark here. It's a little bit hard to see, but what this does is it will open up a browser page to the wiki page associated with this particular panel. So if you need some additional context, you can click that to open up that page. And I'll make sure to provide a link to that particular page in the description below. There are typically four options that relate to the client configuration, and they are whisper notifications, dice entry, remove on miss functionality, as well as map centering behavior, of which we'll cover all four of them here in a moment. The first option is labeled chat colon ring on whisper, which by default is toggled on and is fairly straightforward. When a message is sent to a GM or player via the whisper command, which is the slash W command in the chat box, then it determines if the recipient will hear a bell chime on their end. And while the GM can toggle this setting, it actually has no effect on the player side, and it will keep whatever setting they currently have theirs set to. And the reason for that is it's meant to be independently configured by each person who is actually connected to the campaign server, from the GM through to the various players. Toggling the state of this option is simple. All you have to do is click on this particular element here or on the arrows that are on either side of the button, and it will change the state of that particular setting. Sadly, the chime or ring is not customizable in any way that I am aware of, besides turning it on or off at the time of this recording, though that may change in the future. The next option, called Dice Manual Entry, enables or disables the means for manual dice entry of any role that is required. In this case, the default option is set to off, and the act of turning it on is intentional. But as a DM, it should not be interpreted as a player trying to account for bad rolls by the random number generator that Fantasy Grounds makes use of. In some cases, while a DM might prefer that a player use the automatic rolling options, a player just simply likes to take control over their own rolls. When enabled, this option will intercept all available dice rolls that a player or a GM, depending on who has the option enabled, has to make and provide an opportunity for manual entry of that dice roll to be entered into a specific number field, which I'll show you in a second. Once again, toggling this option on on the GM side won't change the state of the player setting, so it's possible for a player to configure this independently of the Dungeon Master, or vice versa. Now I've gone ahead and set up a quick combat scenario. And you can see, as soon as I click this attack button, with the option enabled, this button comes up. And what this does is it gives me, the Dungeon Master, the opportunity to manually enter in something here, and then click on the various options that are here. So if I simply put in, say, 10 here, and then I click on e this particular checkbox, what will happen here is, is that it will take the value of 10 and add in whatever particular bonuses this particular creature gets to the total roll. Now, generally, that 10 that I entered there should have been the result of a manual dice roll that I made on either the table or desk or whatever it is that I'm sitting at. Unfortunately, there are some players out there that will just put in a random number, and this really comes down to a trust thing. Do you really trust the players, and do they trust you? Generally, groups that have been hanging around each other for a while will enable this functionality. Those that are just getting familiar with one another probably won't. If I go ahead and make another attack option, I want to point something out here. This F, or full roll, stands for fake roll. This is only going to be useful if, as the dungeon master, you're hiding the rolls from the client side. And the reason why I say that is because the value of this roll will not be total, totaled together with the bonuses that this particular creature has. So if I go ahead and click on this, you'll see that I rolled a 4, but the total roll here is a 0. That means that the Dungeon Master is quote-unquote faking a roll, and this could be done to continue on a role-playing scenario, make the players think something's happening when it in fact it is not, things like that. So there's a whole 
slew of reasons as to why you could actually go through and make that roll. Now, the other option that pops up is this option here. And this is just the equivalent of automatically rolling as if you never let the system intercept the roll in the first place. It'll go through and automatically roll for you and then continue on with the rest of the scenario. And finally, if you accidentally roll, never fear, there is an option for you. This little X up here will cancel the roll. That way it never actually shows up here in any way, shape, or form. And it just gives you the means to actually go through and cancel it. But the primary purpose of this is to allow a player or a DM to manually enter in a value that they themselves have manually rolled and then apply all of the appropriate bonuses without having to go through and calculate it up. And this will work for attack rolls, damage rolls, as well as for things like saving throws and ability checks. So that's going to intercept all of those rolls in order to handle some form of manual entry. Now, before we move on, I want to go and show you what this looks like if you happen to have something that has multiple rolls. So I'm going to double click that to trigger the first roll. And you will see here that there is a total of 1d6 plus 4 here in addition to 3d6 additional damage. All four of those particular dice are here. So you would have to go through and roll 4d6 and then apply the values appropriately. And then that will automatically be added to the actual expression, if you will, for the total amount of damage to be dealt with. So you don't have to worry about having this pop up two separate rolls. It'll all be handled in one roll. It should also be noted that if the dice tower, which is an option we will be covering in another video, is enabled and the requested roll is dropped into the dice tower. So if I took this attack roll and dropped it into a dice tower that is down here, it is not going to be intercepted by the manual dice option and it will always make use of the automatic rolling provided by the gaming system. The next option is called target remove on miss. And this relates to what happens when an attack misses in relation to a melee, ranged, or spell related attack. There are three options and they are on, off and multi, of which multi is the default setting and is something that can be independently configured by both the player or the dungeon master. The behavior of this setting changes depending on the option, obviously, but it also changes under specific situations. When on, any time an attack misses, the target of that roll will be removed from the actor's target list, meaning that if a player attacked an orc and missed, Fantasy Grand's Unity will automatically untarget that orc from the player. This is highly useful if that player might be accidentally rolling damage because they assumed that they would hit, as the target would have been removed from their selected list of targets before the damage roll was made, no damage would actually be applied to the target. However, it is just as easy for that player to completely forget that they lost their targeting in the previous round and attempt to attack an untargeted creature or object, thus whiffing their attack. When this is set to off, nothing really changes. The target is going to remain targeted but this also does have a downside. Any target that was technically missed would still suffer damage when making use of the automation of Fantasy Grounds Unity when rolling damage against groups of targets, and that damage would have to be reversed against those that were missed within that group. Additionally, if there was an accidental damage roll against a creature that was missed, that damage would have to be reversed by the DM as well. But it avoids the issue of a player forgetting that they lost their target for the next attack roll. Finally, when the option is set to multi, the best of both worlds are combined, and the only time a target is removed from a player or creature's list of active targets is when there are multiple targets affected by the result of the roll. Using my previous example with the orc, if the player attacks them and multi is configured as the option, it will remain targeted by the player even if they miss, thus ensuring they won't have to retarget that orc the next round. However, if they were attacking multiple targets with a spell, ranged attack, or melee-based attack, those targets that were missed will be removed before the damage is rolled, thus ensuring that damage will only be applied to those who are actually hit by the attack. However, if a saving throw is used where a creature still suffers half damage on a successful save, then those targets will remain targeted until the damage is rolled and then they will be removed from your selected target list. However, that also still applies when the setting is off or on. And that is because saving throws are handled a little bit differently when it comes to this particular option. An example of that would be a fireball spell lobbed at a dozen or so orcs. Those orcs who made their saving throw would still suffer half the amount of total damage rolled 
before they will be then removed from the caster's target list so that they will need to be retargeted the next round. That's just normal behavior across all three of those options. Now I've gone ahead and set up a quick scenario. And the first demonstration I'm going to use is when this is set to off. Now I'm going to go ahead and make a normal attack roll. This is a simulated attack. The principle is going to be the same, but this particular attack is really only meant to go against one creature. However, the concept is going to still apply, even if there is a spell that you're using that you can make use of in relation to multiple targets. So I'm going to go ahead and roll. And what you'll see is some of these I have missed, specifically the dragon in the Mind Flayer, as well as Ape 4 and Ape 2. However, if I go ahead and roll damage, you will see that Ape 2 and Ape 4, as well as our Mind Flayer and Dragon, suffer to damage. That's not really supposed to happen. Unfortunately, that's what happens when you set this to off. Now, saving throws, they still function as they normally would. So if you go ahead and make a saving throw, and then those that suffered half the damage, they will still be removed from your target list. So saving throws still work as the way that you might expect them to. Now, when this setting is set to on, what's going to happen is, under the same circumstances, if I miss any of these targets, they're going to automatically be removed from my target list before I roll the damage. Which is perfect. This is an excellent scenario because now only those creatures who actually were hit suffer the damage. Whereas a saving throw, it also functions the way that a saving throw normally does. So anyone who was successful will be removed from the list after the damage is applied. Now a saving throw that has no damage when somebody makes their saving throw, that target is still automatically removed. Now, when this is set to multi, whenever I make an attack against a group, those who I miss will be removed from my target list before I roll the damage. Which is great, because this is what we want. And once again, the same thing applies for a saving throw. If there's a saving throw that has an effect or has no half damage on a save, they will also be deselected before you roll the damage associated with that save or apply the effects associated with that save. But once again, if I go ahead and trigger a saving throw, all targets that made their save will remain selected until I roll the damage, and then any of those that made their saving throw will be removed. So that functionality for a saving throw really doesn't change over the course of those three options, as I stated. Now, the last option that can be configured independent of one another is the Turn Auto Center Map option, of which the default is set to On. This option is another straightforward setting in that the view of a player or GM screen when viewing a map will center on the active token during a change of turn adjustment, if you will, from one creature to another in the combat tracker. I personally will disable this feature as one of the first things I do is I generally like to place my map in advance of the next creature and get it set up and ready to go. And I really dislike it when the whole thing jumps around whenever this feature is enabled. But there are situations where this capability is quite useful, especially if there's a large gap between all of the various combatants. They may be on one side of the map or the other. To show what this looks like, I have loaded a couple of characters into the combat tracker that we can see here. And while it is a little difficult to see, you can see that I do have a couple of companions here as well as uh, an enemy here that's loaded onto the map. I'm actually going to move this guy up here. With this option set to on, whenever the combat tracker moves from one token to another, like this, the map is going to automatically center. Now, I don't have the other actors on here, but let me just quickly advance through these, and then we'll get back to our first player, and you can see that the map bounces to the active associated token here on the map. So, for this case, it's the ranger, they're now the active token. If I move to the drake, they're now the active token. And if I move to the vampire, they become the active token. And it centers the map based on that action. If, however, I turn this feature off, and then I go and, say, set up my map to look at, say, a creature that's down here, even if I move the token to a specific actor, and that token shifts to another actor because the turn is progressing, it doesn't move the map. So it's very nice and convenient to do that. And if you're curious, this map is from the Dungeon Master's Guide. 
And those are really the four options that a player and a dungeon master can configure independent of one another. So let's go ahead and move on to the next topic in the series.